Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Emily Blumberg from the University of Pennsylvania, where I'm an infectious disease specialist who works with transplant recipients. My colleague here is Dr. Sharon Bartosh, a pediatric kidney specialist from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. We're here to help you learn how to live your life in a more healthy way. When you get transplanted, it really seems like a fresh start. But then you start hearing about all of these things maybe you can't do, restrictions on your life. But what's the truth? What's the real deal? In the next 45 minutes, we're going to give you the real deal from our viewpoint. Thank you. We're going to talk in the next 40, 45 minutes, as Dr. Blumberg said, about things that you may have been told by your transplant center, things that you may not remember you were told by your transplant center, questions that have come up since you've been a transplant. How do I be safe at home? How do I keep my pediatric, my children who might be transplant patients safe? Do I need to keep my children in a bubble? Well, there's some very basic keys to success, hand washing, immunization, routine health maintenance, but we're gonna go into those things in much more detail for you. One of the questions I get asked all the time is, is my water safe? You get transplanted, and the first thing we tell you is drink. Drink a lot. No, you're not drinking enough. And you go, well, I'm trying, but what am I supposed to actually be drinking? And really, we expect that a mainstay of what you're going to be drinking is water. But not everybody's water supply is the same. If you live in a city or a large town, the likelihood is that your water is going to come from a municipal water supply, which goes through a certain amount of filtering and protective measures that actually make the water safe. But many of my patients actually have well water, and not all well water is equal. And in some cases, it can be contaminated with bacteria or perhaps even some other types of organisms that could be dangerous. So what we tell our patients who have well water is they need to actually get it checked out before they start drinking it after transplant just to make sure that it's okay. Sometimes you'll find out maybe it does have some issues. Well, you can deal with that in one of several ways. One way to deal with it is just boil the water that you are going to drink and then just keep it somewhere in jugs or refrigerators so that you can actually use that water supply for your primary drinking supply. But sometimes the easiest thing is just to use bottled water. We're often asked, well, what if I put this filter on or use a Brita or something like that? And in fact, most of those actually don't make much difference. So the best thing is to look at the water supply that you have yourself check it out, check out the municipal settings, and then decide from there. We're also asked a lot about food. We want you to eat a healthy diet, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what that's like in a few minutes. But from my standpoint, I'm often asked, well, what does that mean? Can I eat my meat rare? Can I eat raw food, raw shellfish, raw um, seafood? Are there problems with cheeses? And the advice I'm going to give you now is the advice that I give my friends and family who have not had transplants, and it's all related to food safety in the United States. So periodically in the U.S., but very rarely, we'll have food outbreaks. And they've often been linked to several types of foods. One of the types of foods that they've been linked to is very undercooked meats. And you may have heard about people who've gotten this infection called E. coli, O157H7. In fact, some people have even lost their kidney function related to this very terrible infection. And it turns out that one of the p sources of this infection has been very rare, raw, or raw meat. And so we really recommend that you move away from eating raw meats and that you actually try to bring the temperature up a little bit on your meat. So you're not eating super rare meat, which can be a source of this unfortunate infection. When it comes to cheeses, the vast majority of cheeses in the United States come from pasteurized milk products, which are totally fine and can be eaten. There are no restrictions on that. But sometimes, for some people who like more gourmet types of cheeses, 
they may be interested in things that may come, especially internationally, that may be made with raw milk. And raw milk is actually a problem that, again, isn't just for transplant recipients, but for others, raw milk can contain a bacteria that can be quite dangerous if you have immunosuppression or if you're a pregnant woman, for example. And so we really want you to stay away from raw milk cheeses. When it comes time for things like sushi, we prefer that you take sushi um, that really has the cooked products as opposed to the uh, raw fish. And finally, we want you to definitely stay away from raw shellfish. So oysters, I hope you don't love them because this is the time to say goodbye. But again, I would tell this to other people mm -hmm. too. And every mm -hmm. time my husband goes for the raw oysters, I think, I hope he doesn't get sick because they have been known to carry Vibrio, which is a, a problem. Finally, I have a lot of patients who love cold cuts. We all take them, we make sandwiches out of them. And unfortunately, cold cuts that are cold stored for a prolonged period of time have also been a source of foodborne illness. So if you're a cold cut eater, just buy enough for that one day, eat it, and then the next time you want to go, buy another. Now, that's not necessarily the prepackaged things that you get, right. but it's the cold cuts get get sliced in the delicatessen or the supermarket by single servings so that you don't run the risk of infection later on. So the packaged ones from the processors tend to be better and safer. Yeah. The only thing I would like to add uh, to what Dr. Blumberg said is about the raw meat. So ground meat that is undercooked is going to be more likely to have a problem than a steak that is undercooked because the bacteria is going to be ground into the meat, whereas as with a steak, it's going to be in the outside of the meat, and so if the outside is cooked well, it's a little safer than if, an, of, than if a hamburger is undercooked. So you've got your transplant, it's doing well, you want to get back to your sports, you want to get, stay active, we want you to stay active but there are certain restrictions that you may have heard from your transplant center. You're not sure if the sports you used to participate in are, are safe for you to participate. There are some activities that are, we feel are relatively safe, and those are running, walking, basketball, swimming, volleyball, aerobics, skating, tennis, soccer, biking, golf, canoeing, and even weightlifting, as long as it's low weight, high repetition. But there are other activities that we frown upon, although it's all with caveats. And these are activities that we frown upon for everybody, not just transplant patients. So these are activities where you have risks that have nothing to do with you being a transplant patient. Football, karate, martial arts, ice hockey, trampolines, boxing, dodgeball, gymnastics, certain forms of gymnastics, ATV and snowmobiling. Now, even on this list is downhill skiing and snowboarding and tubing and sledding. It's not that those activities in and of themselves are dangerous. It's hitting things while you're doing those activities. So skiing or uh, through the woods, not wearing a helmet, tubing down a hill and hitting a park bench at the bottom of the hill. Those are the risks with those activities. Being thrown off a horse, that's uh, something that puts your kidneys at risk. As far as weightlifting is concerned, we try to have our patients stay away from the very, from powerlifting or very high weight, low repetition activities. But again, if you did something before your transplant or you want to do something after your transplant and it's on this no-go list, have a conversation with your center. You may be able, with some modifications, to participate in things that you thought might not be able to be participated in. We want you to be active because activity is good for your heart, it's good for your bones. So speaking of your bones, we know that transplant patients in general have a higher risk of developing osteoporosis, and that means they have a higher fracture risk. 
So one of the things you should be talking to your transplant program about is what your vitamin D levels are. If you live in America, you likely have some vitamin D deficiency. So many Americans in general need to be supplemented with vitamin D. You may also need to be supplemented with calcium. Even though women in America, as part of their routine care when they get older, get routine bone densitometry scans to see the health of their bones, transplant patients may get den bone densitometry scans earlier than their older years to keep a track on the health of their bones. So if you're on medications, particularly prednisone, your center may do bone densitometry scans every one and a half to two years to keep an eye on things so that if you are at risk, you know you're at risk. The other thing we are concerned about is that being a transplant patient, being on corticosteroids, prednisone, can increase the risk that you have joint problems, particularly in your lower extremities. So if you're having pain in your hip, your knees, your ankles, and that pain is not going away, tell your transplant program about it. Oh, the sun. So in America, being tan is a sign of health, uh, that healthy glow. But the sun is not your friend, <laughs> unfortunately. Skin cancer has a higher risk. You have a, a, patients who are transplant patients or who are immunosuppressed for any other reason have a higher risk of developing skin cancer. And so skin protection is really super important for our patients. Stay out of the sun between 10 and 2. Wear a hat. Wear SPF skin, uh, SPF um, lotion that is at least 30 or higher. If you have moles, that's something that needs to be also taken care of and monitored on a regular basis. Some of the larger transplant programs will have um, transplant dermatologists that you can go to on a yearly basis to keep track of your skin lesions. And definitely no tanning beds. And if you need sunscreen, we have it at our booth right behind us. We have lots of little jars of it. We're giving it away as well as lip, uh, chapstick that has sunscreen too. I, I think the important thing about this that I forgot to mention is that even if you have, uh, if you are a person of color, you are still at risk. So we encourage activity and there's nothing better than swimming, especially on a hot day, like it's been around here. Mm -hmm. In particular, we recommend swimming in chlorinated pools and in the ocean unless you're sort of on the ch border of the Chesapeake, which has occasionally been a little contaminated recently. But other than that, we really think that swimming is a great exercise. Now, one of the questions that I get a lot is, I live near a lake or I live near a river, can I swim in that sort of fresh water? And fresh water actually poses a slightly higher risk for the swimmer if you're on immunosuppression. Why is that? It's because there are a certain number of organisms that are more likely to survive in fresh water. And what they are differ based on whether you're in the northern climates or in southern climates. So for example, in like where we live up sort of in the northeast or in Montana, for example, you might find something called Giardia living in the fresh water. And if you get Giardia, you could have diarrhea for a very long time. So you really don't want that. If you live south, there may be some parasites that have been associated with meningitis. And so that's also something we need to think about. So before you start your freshwater swimming, you really ought to find out from the local health authorities if there are issues with that fresh water that you would like to swim in. Because we certainly want you to have a good swimming experience and not one that will be memorable for other reasons. So think twice rivers and lakes. Okay, you've had your transplant, things are going well, you're feeling great, your appetite is back, you're eating well, and you're gaining weight. That was not all that you bargained for with this transplant. Now you may be gaining weight because you just have a great appetite now and you're, you're excited to be eating again. Or you may be gaining weight because you're on a medicine like prednisone, which increases your appetite. Prednisone does not make people gain weight. Prednisone makes people intensely hungry. And eating because they're intensely hungry is what makes them gain weight. 
regardless of why you're gaining weight, we'd like you to try to put the brakes on that because we worry about your long-term health, your cardiovascular risk, we worry about the, risk, the increased risk of developing diabetes. We worry about your hypertension getting worse. We worry about your bones having effects of, having, of, of gaining a lot of weight. So we really do advise diets that are low in saturated fat, low in cholesterol, low in trans fat, diets that are high in fiber, diets that are low in sodium. Now, if you go to the store and you pick something off the shelf that's easy to put on your table, it's typically processed, it's typically high in calories, it's typically high in salt. Unfortunately, but, but in a good way, the best, the best way for us to feed ourselves is with fresh fruits and vegetables and our own preparing of those meals. That's the way that we have much more control over it. We can get rid of all the preservatives, and we can really take control over what's on our diet. Going back to the, to the diet a little bit, if you have gotten to the point where you've gained a lot of weight and you're thinking about um, engaging in some type of diet, like a ketogenic diet, um, or some other diet that happens to be popular, Again, please talk to your transplant center. They want to help you. They all have nutritionists. They can go through the pros and cons of the different types of diets and whether or not any of them have any particular risks for you. Now, dietary supplements is another thing that we get as physicians a lot of questions about. Dietary supplements are over the counter. They don't require a prescription. How hard could, you know, how dangerous could they be? And many of them are not, but many of them are and it depends on what they are. Particularly when I have teenage patients who are active in their high school sports and they're, or they're in college and they're active in sports and their coach is um, encouraging them to take a protein supplement or a creatine supplement, those are not good supplements for patients with kidney transplants. And not everyone knows that. Chinese herbs, they may be very um, potentially dangerous with regard to their interactions with your medications and potential toxicities either to your kidneys or to your liver. So we really just want you to run by us as your transplant professionals what you'd like to take and we can check it out with you. Is it safe or is it not safe? Even things as simple as probiotics our patients have gotten into trouble with because they're immunosuppressed and because the probiotics have organisms in them. And so many transplant centers have completely banned the use of probiotics in their transplant population, but that's something you really need to talk to your ask questions about of your transplant coordinator. And if you're on a list for transplantation and you're taking a probiotic, you really should stop before the transplant because there is a potential that some of those bacteria or yeast forms could be hanging around and cause problems after. And unfortunately, I've had the experience to see that. Yes. So one of the questions that we get a lot, particularly from younger patients, is can I get married? Can I work? Can I have a family? Will I be able to have children? And there's no simple answer to that. The question comes up the most for our kidney transplant patients. And there are lots and lots and lots of successful stories of patients having families. One of the best parts about my job is getting invited to high school graduations, to college graduations, to weddings, to be sent pictures and birth announcements of my patients having families of their own. It's a fabulous thing. But it's a decision that you have to make very carefully. It's a decision that requires a lot of counseling. It's not something that ideally should happen by accident. So if you're thinking about having a child, you have to have that conversation with your transplant center. There are medications that you're on now that you will not be able to be on if you're pregnant. They're not good for the baby. And so a lot of planning and preparation, um, if you have good kidney function, things are likely to go well. But if your kidney function isn't as good, those are conversations that you need to have with your transplant team so that you can go forward with the knowledge that you need to make good decisions.
there are ramifications for the pregnancy itself as well as for your health. And so we ask, if you're planning to be pregnant, if you'd like to be pregnant, just tell us about it. We'll talk about it with you. Um, if by chance you become pregnant accidentally, tell us right away because you have to alter what medications you're on so that they don't hurt the baby. Transplant recipients have pets, just like everybody else. And we love to hear about the pets, and we even like to see the pictures, maybe not as much as the babies, but close. But not all pets are equally safe. Usually, we like to have the conversation about what pets you have before you go to transplant, so we can sort of prepare and try to figure out how to make that arrangement very safe. We love dogs and cats, and there's absolutely no restrictions when you own those. But there are some pets that are perhaps not ideal. Those include rodents, and in particular, birds, which sometimes have been associated with some specific infections that can be very difficult treat, to treat. In general, we recommend against all reptiles and amphibians. We do not want, and this is not just for transplant recipients, I don't think anybody should own a turtle at this point because turtles have been linked to really bad outbreaks of salmonella in the United States. It's time after time, we'll go through one outbreak and people go, oh, now it's okay, and then they'll buy more turtles and it keeps happening. Salmonella is not a good infection to have for anybody. It's especially not good if you're a transplant patient. Mm -hmm. And if you have a turtle, I'm sorry, that's where I draw the line. But if you have birds or other, like hamsters, gerbils, before the transplant happens, we really should talk about it. One of the things that I'm asked a lot about is kitty litter and what to do with the cats. In general, we think cats are great pets for transplant patients, or for anybody, really. But there is an issue in that the kitty litter is a nice fermenting environment for organisms that live in the cat poo. And so, in general, we really think that if you're going to have a cat, if you're lucky enough to have somebody who lives with you, that they just bought the care of the cat litter. And this is the one thing you said, oh, I'm a transplant recipient. I was told I can't handle that anymore. Go for it. Let's say, though, you're by yourself or the people you live with are absolutely not going to do that. Then my recommendation is that you scoop that litter every day because the organisms we're worried about take over 24 hours to sporulate and become infectious. And that when you're actually dumping the full litter, that you make sure you do it in a way that you're protecting your airway. And if it's going to be aerosolized up, that you put something over your face so that you're not actually breathing the stuff in. Now, it's important to do several things as well. The first is it's really important to hand wash when you're handling your pets. And I also want to counsel against letting your pets lick your wounds letting your pets chew on your IV tubing. You may say, that can't be, but I've seen it all. It's generally a good idea to keep pets away from your medical equipment. Finally, remember that your pets require health care too, and keeping them healthy will keep you healthy. We were talking to somebody earlier who pointed out that he had a cat that was an indoor-outdoor cat and that cat periodically liked to bring in gifts. They were generally not live gifts by the time they made <laughs> it to his floor. And so in these cases, it's important to realize that you want to protect your pet from getting sick from their exposure to the external environment, but also if you have to handle those gifts that mm -hmm. they bring in, mm -hmm. please do it with care, wearing gloves, and trying not to touch them and ha actively washing your hands afterwards. Lots of our patients garden. In fact, some of them have amazing gardens that they show me pictures of that I'm very jealous of because half the time I forget to water mine. Gardens are great, and we don't want to disrupt your ability to garden just because you've had a transplant. 
but we ask our patients to defer gardening for the first year after transplant because we really hope that you're not going to be exposed to things that may be in your garden at a time when you're especially susceptible to infection, when you're at your highest level of immune suppression. The things we're talking about are bacteria and molds that live in the soil, as well as the insects that may be in the environment. And in my neck of the woods in the Northeast, the insects we're really worried about are ticks. And so in general, we say, try to lay low for the year. And when you return to the garden, you should do a couple of things to protect yourself, some of which I recommend for everybody. Wear gloves if you're going to be touching, you know, digging in the dirt. Try to cover as much of your skin as possible. And in our neck of the woods, we recommend wearing light colored clothing, especially like white socks and stuff, mm -hmm. because then it'll be easier for you to see if ticks are on the clothing so that you won't get tick bites. If you're involved in activities that are going to be aerosolizing soil in your face, let's say you're a rototiller, or maybe your occupation is that you actually are a groundskeeper or something that's going to involve a lot of exposure. We want you to protect your airways. And I don't mean with those little cloth masks that everybody's wearing. What I want you to do is either get from your transplant centers the types of masks that we use to protect people against tuberculosis, or just go to your local Home Depot or similar sort of Lowe's or whatever. It's not supposed to be an advertisement for one particular train. And ask them about something that says N95 on it, because that N95 is going to cover the size of the particles that we're worried about coming in your face. I'm a firm believer in insect repellent. And that's not just for transplant recipients. That mm -hmm. is for everybody. This is prime tick and mosquito time where I live, and I bet where a lot of you live as well. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, these little critters have been problematic for many of us. And they do carry a lot of diseases, including things like Lyme disease, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, and West Nile virus in the case of mosquitoes, as well as some other things too. And so what we want you to do is we want you, if you're going outside and you live in tick country or you're hiking in the woods, that you come back in and you immediately check your exposed skin, including those difficult to see areas around your face and in your scalp, and check them for ticks. The best protection you have is to pull that tick off less than 24 hours after it's been feeding, because they're not that efficient at transmitting disease. And if they haven't been there for very long, nothing's going to happen. But if the tick has a couple of days to feast on your blood, we could be in trouble. And so what we want you to do is check early. Now, when you pull the tick off, you want to make sure you get the head off. So you take a tweezers, and you can actually pull from the head and pull the whole thing off. Try to make sure you have the whole thing. Now, let's say you discover a tick, and you don't know how long it's been there. The best thing to do is save that tick and bring it to your local transplant center, because there are those of us who work in infectious disease, and we love passing these things around and trying to figure out how long it's been there and what your risk mm -hmm. is going to be, and also what kind of tick it is, because the dangers are different depending on the different ticks. So definitely enlist our help. Now, OK, you've been transplanted. You want to live your life. And let's face it, sometimes you just have to relax, right? And that might include alcohol. And many people actually do you know, have a little alcohol after transplant. I saw a lot of alcohol being served at all the events so far. So I'm pretty sure that you know mm -hmm. this is going on. And in fact, alcohol in moderation is certainly acceptable for many transplant recipients. But we do want to make sure that you've cleared that with your transplant center to just find out if in your specific personal situation, there may be restrictions because we want you to enjoy your life and not run into complications that could have been anticipated and prevented. Now, lots of states in the United States have marijuana. In our state, it's sort of hovering on the legal, illegal borders. And we no longer ask our patients if they partake. We just assume it could happen. So we tell patients a number of things. 
The first is there may be risks to marijuana. Some of them are anticipated. A little mental impairment, well, that's probably part of the reason you might have been using it to begin with, to kind of feel a little juiced, right? But but there are other possibilities that can occur. Some of those include drug interactions, which may be a problem. Mm -hmm. There have been reports of kidney injury or abnormal heart rhythms. From my standpoint as an infectious disease doctor, the thing I worry about is infection with life-threatening molds. Something called aspergillus has clearly been found. And why is that? Because this is a product that is grown in the dirt, where I just told you there was aspergillus before. So. We tell our patients who are going to be interested in using marijuana that they got to cook it first. So it has to bake at at least 300 degrees for at least 15 minutes. And in general, marijuana should be consumed as an edible, not smoking. So don't, don't smoke your weed. <laughs> and really, honesty is the best policy you got to talk with people so we know what you're doing. So if something happens, we'll factor in all the possibilities mm -hmm. and not just the ones you want us to know about. Yeah. We're definitely not advocating that you go out and No, I'm not do saying go smoke, <laughs> but let's face it. <laughs> but we're people being, do what they're going to do. We're being practical and honest, and this is the state of the country. So I notice I've been watching um, people at the games, and I notice that there's not a whole lot of people wearing either medical alert dog tags or medical alert bracelets. And I, I'm a little, was a little confused by that because we spend a lot of time, because I take care of children, and we spend a lot of time counseling that as soon as your child is out there on the road, they have their license, they're in a car by themselves, you are no longer with them all the time, and they have the potential to be in a car accident by themselves and be unconscious, they need to have a medical alert bracelet, something, because their emergency providers, whether it's the ambulance crew or the emergency room, needs to know they're a transplant patient, they're immunosuppressed, they should or shouldn't, you know, sh can or can't get non-steroidals like Advil, Motrin, Ibuprofen. And so uh, we feel pretty strongly that if you're ever going to be alone and you're ever going to be potentially in a situation where you are unconscious in an emergency room, you need some way to tell those providers who you are and what your needs are. It's hard to say exactly what you should put on your, on your notification because everyone is going to have individual needs. So I would suggest talking to your coordinator. But some very common ones would be that you're immunosuppressed, that you're, that you're on prednisone, that you're diabetic, and that you shouldn't take non-steroidals. But there may be more things in your case. So again, as a pediatrician, I get asked a lot, should my children go to school? Well. If your plan was to homeschool your children, then you should continue to plan to homeschool your children. But if your plan was to keep your children in, a, in public school where they have uh, more socialization, then we want you to do that. We really stress that we'd like our patients, both adult patients and pediatric patients, children, to have the best, most normal life that was intended for them. We do keep our children out of school for, and this would be the same thing for adults, we keep them out of um, school for at least a month to four weeks. Sometimes if they're going back to school and it's the peak of the influenza season, we may keep them out a little longer. Or if they're heavily immunosuppressed because we're treating them for rejection, we might keep them out a little longer. But we do try to get them back in school. But what's important about it is that the the school, the nurse, the teacher, they all need to know that your patient, that your child is a transplant patient. It's not that, uh, it's hard because you want some privacy. You don't want everybody in the community potentially to know. But it is important that those key people know that your child is a transplant patient because if there's a case of chickenpox in the class or there's a case of strep in the class, you need to be notified quickly so that you can then call your transplant center and say, Johnny's been exposed to chickenpox, what should I do? And I want to just put in a word for the adults who are working in schools. 
I have a lot of patients who actually are school teachers, some of them at the elementary school level, and they love their jobs and they want to go back, and we want them to go mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. But I give them a few words of advice. The first is, you got to keep lots of boxes of tissues all around the classroom with strategically placed waste baskets because you do not want these kids rubbing their faces and then giving you their dirty tissues. They have to learn to fend for themselves. The other thing is I tell them they need to have strategically placed waterless hand sanitizer yeah, sure. around the environment of their classroom and everybody should engage in a lot of hand washing and infectious disease in general hand washing is one of the best defenses that will keep you healthy and we want all of our kids to do it because it's going to keep the whole classroom healthy and it's going to keep the transplant patient people in their lives healthy as well Travel's a wonderful thing, and in fact, many of the transplant recipients I know have traveled places that I'm quite envious of going. One of the best parts of my job is when I get a call that I'm going to be seeing a patient because they have this amazing trip planned. And we love it, and we're excited, and the only thing I want to see are great pictures afterwards. But you can't travel without preparation, and while this is actually true of everyone, not just of transplant recipients, it's especially important for transplant recipients. The first thing that we want you to do is if you're traveling anywhere, really, you ought to review the travel itinerary with your transplant team be before booking it so that in case you're going somewhere that there may be precautions that need to be followed, you'll be prepared before you put down a whole bunch of money for a trip that maybe wasn't the best idea. For anybody traveling on airplanes these days, you absolutely must keep all of your medications in your carry-on, and you should travel with a doctor's note that specifies what those medications are. In some cases, this might include liquids, things that need refrigeration, things that come with a syringe, and you need to be able to keep those because the last thing we want you to do is have some airline lose your luggage with your medications because that would just really wreck the whole trip. So you really need to put the, lug the meds in your carry-on and bring your doctor's note so that in case something happens and you need to refill, you'll have evidence of something that shows exactly what you're taking. Wherever you go, you should have a plan just in case you get sick. This may mean knowing what the transplant centers might be in the area where you could get care that might be very good for you. And there's actually information on statedepartment.gov and in the CDC that actually talks about this a little bit. But there's also sometimes, if you're going to really exotic places, the a benefit to actually getting travel insurance that comes with evacuation insurance mm -hmm. just in case. Again, not something I just tell transplant recipients, but advise to people who are doing more adventurous travel just in case. Now, for those individuals who want to explore the developing world, this can be great and a really not to be missed experience. But there are a couple of things that are important to follow. Again, not just for transplant recipients, but this is what we tell everybody in our travel clinic, to stay healthy, to make sure that you're enjoying your trip rather than spending the time in various emergency rooms or health facilities mm -hmm. instead. The first of this has to do with water safety. In the developing world, pretty much all the water sources, the tap water sources, are not safe to drink. Okay? And in many places, fresh fruits and vegetables also need to be handled specific, in special ways to make them safe. So many years ago, the CDC developed this phrase that we tell all of our patients. When you're thinking about fresh fruits and vegetables, boil it, cook it, peel it, as in a banana or melons, or forget it. Sorry, but that's got to be the way it is. And then when it comes to water, really stick with bottled water, even for things like brushing your teeth, to just make sure you're not going to get sick from it. Unfortunately, in the United States, we like our beverages cold, but you got to say goodbye to ice cubes. 
Never drink drinks that come with ice cubes, because that ice cube is not made with bottled water. It's made with their tap water, so we don't really want you to get sick. Traveler's diarrhea is very common in many people who travel, not just transplant recipients. But traveler's diarrhea comes at a little different cost for transplant recipients. Because if you get really dehydrated, your prograph level, your tacrolimus mm -hmm. level, your cyclosporin levels, those are going to go up. And you're going to experience all of the side effects of those levels being higher related to your dehydration. So before you embark on this great journey, you should meet with a travel specialist, especially one who's used to working with transplant patients, to have a plan for what you do if you get diarrhea when you travel. And so I have like this whole schema that I work out with my patients when they travel to just say, OK, this is what we're going to do. Many of these exotic locations are in places with lots of sun and sometimes lots of bugs. And so what we recommend is, as Dr. Bartosz said earlier, it's really important to use sunscreen. But the quick question is, well, what do you put on first, the sunscreen or the insect repellent? And you always want the insect repellent to be the last thing you put on because the insects aren't going to be sent away by your sunscreen, but they will be repelled by your insect repellent. And so it's important to apply your sunscreen, then your insect repellent, and to potentially reapply it if you're going to be out for multiple hours mm -hmm. during the day. If you're going to a zone where there's malaria, there's lots of good options for preventing malaria that are safe in transplantation. But again, they have to be planned for in advance. So that's another reason to, before you book your travel, go to your transplant team, get an infectious disease doctor to tell you what the preventive medicines there are that are going to be most important for you. Early preparation is also important because some of the parts of the world you might want to go to, you might need some vaccinations for. And pretty much all the vaccinations that we give non-transplant recipients, we would give you with one exception, and that's yellow fever vaccine. If you wanted to get yellow fever vaccine, you can't. And so if you want to go to a place where it's going to be, we have to assess the risk and either write you a waiver if we think the yellow fever risk is very low. Because if you enter the country, you may not be able to enter into a different country afterwards because you don't have evidence of yellow fever protection and people want to keep yellow fever out of their country. But in general, we, avoid, we advise not going to those places. Some of our transplant recipients are actually born in other parts of the world, and they haven't had a chance to go home for a while because they've been dealing with their health issues. And they get well after their transplant, and they say, now I'm going home. And they say, I would love to go back to whatever part of the developing world. They have family, they have friends in. And what's important to realize is just because you're going home doesn't make it safer. And all of those precautions I talked about already they do apply to you regardless of whether you've lived there before because the immunity you might have had from living in these places for a long time does not persist when you've been out of the zone for a while. So it's important to think about that. And if you want to sort of research the precautions that might be necessary yourself, cdc.gov is a great website. They have a part of it that's for the traveler and a part of it that's for the healthcare provider. And it's really interesting to read and they tell you about what outbreaks might be in the area and what else is going on. When you're talking to an infectious disease doctor and a pediatrician, we love vaccines. Oh, yeah. It's amazing to me that vaccines have become sort of the scourge of the in, in many communities in the United States. In fact, so bad that one of my colleagues who works in our pediatric hospital, who's been a major proponent of vaccines, has been getting death threats for years. Vaccines save an estimated 42,000 lives per year. That's three times more than seat belts and child restraints, things that we accept as really important. Vaccines prevent a whole array of illnesses. These are just the majority. Mumps, measles, rubella, influenza, whooping cough, pneumonia, hepatitis, chickenpox, polio, tetanus, diphtheria, meningitis, and now there's even a vaccine against cancer, the HPV vaccine. 
it's hard to ignore the impact of vaccines on the health of our country, our friends, our family, ourselves. Vaccines protect you, they protect your family, and they're really important in the setting of transplantation. But you have to start thinking about vaccines before the transplant, because you're gonna be a better vaccine candidate, a better vaccine responder if you're vaccinated before transplant for things that you might have missed. So it's important to check your records. That's sometimes hard for those of us who are in a little bit more advanced ages, and we may not have any records, but it's best to your, of your, to your knowledge, you really ought to check and see what you've gotten and see what needs to be updated, because it's better if you do it before the transplant to get the best response. After transplant, you may not be able to get vaccines for up to a year, although we do avoid, we do give some things like influenza early if we're in the middle of flu season. Mm -hmm. And in general, except in certain circumstances, we avoid live vaccines. We continue to update the standard ones. Annual flu shots are really important, not just for you, but for everybody around you. Pneumonia vaccines, tetanus with pertussis are important. And there may be other vaccines that your providers may want to give you based on your own special circumstances. Make sure your household is protected as well. I can't tell you, this year was a terrible flu year. People with no abnormal health issues got very sick and in some cases died from influenza. You're doing a service to everybody. If you make them get vaccinated to protect you, they're really protecting themselves. So, a couple of mundane things that we'd like to get through, just to make sure we're covering all the bases. And people don't tend to understand how important their oral health is. I mean, there's bacteria in your mouth, most people know that but gum disease has effects on the rest of the body that go beyond the mouth. So there's an association between gum disease and heart disease. So we really, as part of your routine care, want you, hopefully you have dental insurance, but want you to go to the dentist twice a year for your cleanings. Now some transplant centers, but not all, there's a difference in practice across the country, will advocate and write you a prescription for a large dose of amoxicillin or some other antibiotic if you're amoxicillin allergic for your dental work, your dental cleaning, for the time where the dentist is really um, 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 uh, working around in your mouth. Working around your mouth and stirring up, that's the word I was looking for, stirring up those bacteria that can get into your bloodstream, and so that's what the antibiotic is to protect you for. So ask your coordinator when you're going to the dentist, do they recommend any antibiotics or not? I'm sorry. Yes. Your eyes, particularly if you're on some immunosuppression medications like corticosteroids, prednisone, we'd like you to get a dilated eye exam once a year to monitor for cataracts and glaucoma. The other thing about the eyes that's important is that some of the viruses that, and, uh, that our patients can be afflicted with, you might have heard the word CMV, EBV, BK, but some of those viruses can affect the eye. So that if you're having eye symptoms, tell your center right away. And then lastly, we wanted to talk about generics for a minute. Now, generics are not evil. And some of you may even leave the hospital from your initial transplant hospitalization on generics. The important thing about generics is that you stick with the same generic. And so you have to have a relationship, or you should have a relationship with your pharmacist so that they know if your generic changes, if the pharmacy distributor decides to buy their generic from another manufacturer, that you're told that so that you can share that information with your transplant center, and maybe they'll check your levels a little more frequently for a while to make sure that this change in the generic supplier hasn't affected your metabolism and your levels, which is, as you know, how we dose your medications in many cases. So we hope we've given you a few tips for just enjoying your transplant, enjoying your lives, making the most of what's really been a gift of life. If you have any questions, you really should just always feel comfortable sharing your concerns with the transplant center 
because really all of us who went into this went into it because we, our goal is to let you really reap the benefits of all of this that you've gone through. So we're all here to help and Dr. Bartosz and I will be over there if you have questions because I don't know if there's time for one question or not. Maybe one question if there's a question. Ray, there's somebody down here. He, she's going to give you a microphone. I was originally told after my liver transplant that I should not be around pets or children for a couple weeks after they get vaccinated with a live vaccine. Yeah. Is that true? So that's actually a very complicated question. And depending on when your liver transplant was, it may be even more complicated. In general, the one live vaccine we were really worried about is no longer given, and that's oral polio vaccine. Because oral polio vaccine in young children, if you're changing their diapers, there's been transmission of polio vaccine to people. But if, for example, you've ha you're protected, you've already had chicken pox, measles, mumps, rubella, there's no issue when they're getting those vaccines at all. If they get a rash, from the vaccine, you probably want to stay away a little bit. But in general, you know, transplant recipients are parents too, and I think the worst thing to do is to remove you from your child. You and know? how about um, my liver transplant was 15 months ago. How um, about with pets? That's and, my main and in thing. terms of pets, you know, we don't. If you have dogs and cats, we don't ever remove. I've had patients who've had some pretty weird animals, and I don't want them around. One guy had a, a iguana that resided in his living room. I've had a lot of patients yeah. who've had a lot of birds. And so, but if you have dogs and cats, you've got to hand wash and get somebody else to scoop the litter. Oh, mm -hmm. I was told with my dogs, I'm fine to be around them, but if they get vaccinated, don't be around them oh. for a little while after yeah, that. Yeah, so there's been, this is actually an interesting question. The big vaccine that people are concerned about is the pertussis, the whooping, the, it actually it's kennel cough. And that's, and sort of the jury's out about that a little bit. And actually, to be honest, I don't think anybody knows the answer. So what I would do is just make sure you're hand washing extensively, you know, if your dog is getting the pertussis vaccine, their pertur pertussis. Did you have one more minute? Sure, sure. <laughs> Strange as this sounds, we have a dog a small dog that ended up with a staph infection. Is yeah. that something I completely should stay away from that dog? So like a staph skin infection? Yeah. It, it, yes. Yeah. So staph is a normal organism that lives on all of our skin. That's just, that's just what's there. And in general, when people or pets are colonized with staph, we definitely want to make sure that you're protected, but protection really is, again, hand hygiene and just making sure if the dog has draining wounds or something like that, rashes, scabs, that you're not touching that area and that when you are with your pet that, you know, you're using a little precaution in terms of that and you're not the one delivering the pet care. But there's no reason to remove the dog from the house or anything like that, but it's really good. Hand washing goes a long way to preventing a lot of things. And when I say hand washing, I mean either with that waterless hand, uh, you know, sanitizer or washing your hands with soap and water. You could buy the pump antibacterial soap and just sing the ABC song. And when you're done, then you know that you've actually washed your hands thoroughly. Great. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.